Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Metadata and the Power of Pattern Finder Findings, sponsored by Objectivity. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. If you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us and we're with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right for that feature. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce our speaker for today, Leon Guzenda. Leon was one of the founding members of Objectivity in 1988 and one of the original architects of Objectivity Database. He currently works with Objectivity's major customers to help them efficiently develop and deploy complex applications and systems that use the industry's highest performing, most reliable database technology. He also liaises with technology partners and industry groups to help ensure that objectivity remains at the forefront of database and distributed computing technology. And with that, let me turn the webinar over to Leon to get us started. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon. Hello, everybody. Okay, let's... Uh start here. Um, I'm just going to briefly describe who we are uh, and then talk about open source analytics before uh, saying where we fit in and then moving straight on to pattern finding and applying various kinds of analytics uh, to solve some uh, quite interesting problems. So objectivity has been around quite a while. We've been NoSQL all the time. Uh, we got into big data in the mid-90s when we say big data, we were doing petabytes by the turn of the century. Uh, and you see our verticals here. Uh, we tend to specialize in complex distributed uh, scalable database applications and graph analytics, which has become a, an increasingly important part of our uh, customer base. A uh, few sample customers here uh, spread across the spectrum. No financial customers mentioned there just because they're all very private. So let's get right into talking about uh, data analytics. If we look at open source analytics, I'm sure you'll all be familiar with this stack here. And uh, we have Spark and Kafka, Storm, various mixtures of those things, or Hadoop. Uh, workflow control with Yarn, uh, and then the well-known players at the, at the bottom here, uh, all of whom we partner with, by the way. <coughs> And then you um, run analytic components like MLDIP or GraphX uh, in conjunction with visualization tools. Excuse me. Now, the good thing about that is that there's a very large analytics community out there and lots of algorithms. Uh, some of them overlap a lot, um, but we do know that the model works at scale because that's how big data came about. Uh, people had been running things in high performance clusters or on supercomputers. And now, of course, the paradigm has uh, shifted somewhat to uh, shared nothing. But these, those other technologies still have a large part to play. The great thing is that the startup costs are, are low if you have people who understand technology. And it tends to be very cost effective, although uh, there are situations, of course, where a dedicated machine can, can be more efficient. Uh, as it's been shown by many benchmarks. And from our point of view, what we noticed was that, that most of the analytic algorithms are based on statistical conditions, a co correlation, you know, clustering like k-means, uh, or filtering, setting thresholds. And uh, the graph algorithms out there mainly tackle theoretical problems that came about uh, in the, let's say, the social uh, network era. So things like centrality, page centrality, all those algorithms are very well understood. Then in the big data environment, um, Hadoop was set up to deal with files primarily, um, not with the metadata. And so although uh, almost all of the platform uh, specialists now are adding tools for dealing with metadata, uh, they're almost all focused on the technical parameters. So they know the name of the file, when it was created, when it was last updated, how many records there are in it, that kind of thing. Um, but they're not looking inside the files and getting the semantic content out of them. 
And that's really where we come in. And uh, I'm going to assume that in all these cases, the metadata that's in our graph has been extracted from somewhere. And it, most likely one would have used a tool from one of our partners, someone like Talent, uh, to get the data and blend it and then insert the metadata into the graph. The good thing about all this being object-oriented, of course, is that you can have high-level concepts, uh, with the highest level being the, uh, the vertex, you know, the nodes, and the edges, the connections between them, and the, the properties, uh, the fields, if you like, that go in uh, the, the vertices and edges. Um, but then you can inherit from those things and do all the things you would do with a normal object-oriented language. And so that tends to be very good for dealing with lots of variants. Perhaps one of the best known graph tools out, particularly in the Spark community, is GraphX. And it has a, a very nice, rich set of capabilities. It's, uh, develop, you know, it's continually developing. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But you can do just about anything you need to do with vertices and edge and uh, triplet operations for RGF. And then the graph modification operations and uh, resilient distributed data sets are the Spark construct, uh, where you basically have a, a tabular presentation of the data, no matter what the underlying representation actually is. Uh, you then have to perform join operations to do any kind of navigation or path finding. Uh, there are iterative graph parallel operations and triplet operations. We'll see some of those in operation later. And then things like page rank uh, connected. Uh, connected is very useful for finding things like islands. Now, recently, um, the RDDs were enhanced with things called data frames, which put a schema uh, there. And graph frames um, are more oriented, as the name suggests, to graphs. Excuse me. Um, so they, one of the most particular things about graph frames is that there's a facility called motifs, this little structure which is a subgraph. And that will come in useful, particularly for things like islands. However, if you're trying to do very efficient pathfinding and very complex navigation where you want to include only certain node types or exclude certain node types or the edges, the connections between them, uh, then it becomes less efficient. You're doing lots and lots of implicit join operations. And the good thing about Spark, of course, is these things can occur in parallel, but graph finding operations uh, you need at some point to uh, find the shortest path or find all paths, and there's no easy way to represent that in a, um, in a, in a straightforward tabular structure. So that's where we come in. We are dealing with complex objects where relationships are first-class citizens, and we specialize in ultra-fast navigation and path finding. Uh, we're not limited by the amount of RAM. So Many of the dedicated boxes out there rely on RAM. Uh, we, we don't. And because we're a distributed database with distributed processing, we scale and perform really very well. That's all I'm going to say about our product for the moment, that everything's distributed. And ThingSpan fits in up in the top right-hand corner there into this open environment and provides the metadata store and the very fast pathfinding and navigational access. You can store the data either in HDFS or in POSIX, just depends on what your environment is. It's distributed from top to bottom, so this is kind of unique. Uh, Spark, of course, is distributed. The worker nodes are our clients. Uh, we have a distributed database which fits neatly into the uh, HDFS distributed file system. So it's very good at load balancing. You can scale out and scale up. And then what we do is we provide this REST server and we provide these APIs so that you can perform these various kinds of computation analytics. I'll skip past this. This just shows the components. Let's get right into pattern finding. 
which is the, the core of what this uh, session is about. So I mentioned before that we noticed that most of the analytics out there were using things derived really from the business intelligence world, uh, leaving aside you know, scientific uh, data, which uh, tends to be somewhat different. But they're, they're basically statistical. And you're trying to find relationships between parameters. Uh, the kind of thing you might be looking for is, um, let's imagine that I'm uh, a credit card company and I decide to change the uh, interest rate on certain kinds of transactions for three months in a certain demographic or area. Uh, what I want to do then is come back later and find out whether the number of transactions or the value of the transactions increased, and more importantly, you know, whether we made more or less money out of that little adventure. Um, and that's, that's great, and a lot of analytics is about statistical correlation. But graph pattern finding tends to be rather different. Uh, you can find outliers, uh, these become very important in different kinds of pattern finding. And you can do that with SQL or with MLLib components, things like k-means. Uh, but then you start wanting to do navigational queries to explore out through, uh, through the graph, perhaps selectively. Uh, or you want to do pathfinding queries to find uh, the shortest routes or the most effective routes between things. The order in which you apply these different techniques depends entirely on the problem. Uh, so you, you might start by finding outliers and then do a pathfinding query or do a navigational query, or you might start with um, a straightforward graph X algorithm uh, and then move from there into do a more complex pathfinding, perhaps finding the, uh, the leaves. Um, out on the ground. As an example of pathfinding query here, here's a very simple schema. Uh, the vertices are city objects, and the edges, the connections, are, are these link objects. Uh, the many to many relationship there. Um, the mode would be something like road or rail or air or water. Uh, how long it takes to traverse it typically, and, and the cost. Oops, excuse me. <clears throat> I hope that all got that back. Okay. Um, so we're going to do four examples. And um, starting with one in the financial arena, one in the government arena, uh, one in advertising technology, and an industrial Internet of Things uh, example. So let's look at money laundering. This is a very simple example, I might add. Uh, in reality, uh, things are passed through chains of companies and people. They wouldn't necessarily, or the accounts might not be traceable back to the people at the ends of the chain. But for simplicity here, we've, we've loaded everything into the graph, and we have people and accounts and transactions there. And then what we're going to do first is just use GraphX and use a centrality algorithm uh, and a few lines of code run it in parallel across the, all the uh, people in the graph, and identify people with more than five accounts. That's obviously a threshold that uh, would, be, would be parameterized. And we found one there, person two. So the next step is to explore the graph from there and see where the transaction trail ends. And we're particularly interested in ones that end in offshore accounts. And sure enough, person two has this string of transactions all occurring probably at different times, moving between accounts and ending up uh, probably buying some property or investing in a business somewhere, and then money is moved from there, uh, perhaps periodically, into some other account. So this person and the string of accounts uh, and the companies involved definitely bear investigation. Very simple, but all of this can be automated into a few queries, and it can all be run in parallel, and it can be run as transactions occur. So when a transaction occurs with one of the people that we're interested in, we're beginning to get more and more of the picture, because they might accumulate money in lots of places over quite a long period of time before they make this ultimate move that identifies them as definitely being involved in, in the money. Now, in the government realm, we've just chosen one in the human intelligence uh, side. 
Uh, so this is what security people, home security, uh, and people in the DOD, for instance, are interested in. And what we've done here is we've loaded a graph with people and telephone call detail records, CDRs, so calls, uh, some places that we're either mildly interested in or very interested in protecting, and uh, sightings of uh, people around those locations. And we just cut it down here to people and their telephone calls. And we can use um, GraphX to find islands of callers or, and callees. Uh, this is a, a connected, a tightly connected group, a clique, if you like, the various words for this. Um, if you look for connected in the um, GraphX or any other algorithms, you'll find things that do this. Uh, it's quite tricky. Um, you, you often need to do it iteratively. And of course, things can change. Um, you, can, you can apply the iteration over 20 or 30 cycles and suddenly find that the island is broken because some other connection has come to life. Uh, but this is, this is quite a compute intensive uh, application. And the, the, uh, this first step is really important. Once you've found an island, you can start looking at it more closely. So what we're doing now is we're, we're looking at the people in here, and we're looking to see whether any of them have been sighted near any places that need to be protected. Um, sure enough, we've got something there. If you look, you can see that there are two people, actually P14 and 15, uh, who've been seen near place X, which is something of great interest to us. Uh, and at that point, we can decide that they're of interest, and because they're of interest, and because they are just in this clique, uh, then all five people in that clique need to be carefully uh, looked at as well. Now, this could be quite innocent, obviously, but in reality, uh, we, we, want, um, we want to turn the focus on these people and look a bit more closely at what they're doing. That's interesting, something went very blue here, so I'm not sure why that went blue. Um, all right, so let's hope the next slide is better. So what's happening here is that we want to place ads. So this, of course, is done all the time online. Uh, and what we have is we have products, which are the objects along the top, um, and then we have sales to people. And then we're merging that information in the graph with uh, information on who follows whom in social blogging and so on. And it still remained blue. I'm not sure why it's remained blue. But uh, the star there shows us what we're going to focus on. So we're going to focus on product PR2. And we're going to look and see which of these bloggers uh, bought PR2, who also have followers. And we uh, find out that, um, that Fred, the second person from the left there, bought product two, and that uh, Mary follows Fred's blogs, and Jane and Bill also follow Mary's. So if you're the advertiser, uh, you wait until you see uh, Mary, Jane, or Bill uh, pop up on your site uh, or on one of the sites where you're paying for adverts, and then you put a very subtle message in front of them to go buy product two, or you make an offer uh, to offer them a discount or whatever it's going to be. But this is very straightforward. This needs to run at very high speed. Um, generally, in this kind of application, the initial investigatory work would best be done with Spark uh, and working out the social graph and so on. Um, and then the positioning so that you can present the, uh, the correct adverts to people at the right time, uh, that would probably be cached um, pretty much in memory, uh, waiting for the opportunity to display it in, instantly, because you have very little time uh, in, in the displaying of a page in order to put this information in front of people and, and present the case properly. So it's a mixture of um, 
pre-planning and using um, Spark and, in this case, quite straightforward navigational queries, uh, and then combining it with the server technology that will present the ad at the right right moment, which again is going to be very heavily uh, memory dependent. All right, so haha, this is nice. We've gone back to the white world <laughs> from the blue world. Um, Let's look at another one. Now, there are many areas in the industrial Internet of Things. Uh, I'd encourage you afterwards, if you'd like to look into this area a bit more deeply, um, to have a look at our website where we, we cover things like um, smart homes, you know, adjusting thermostats to put based on uh, Internet um, information on weather, what's going on in homes in the area, and so on. Um, but this one is looking at uh, network equipment. It could be telco. Uh, it could be, could be data transfer. Um, or, or a mixture of the two. So we load all the uh, equipment detail in and the links and the loadings, the percentage load on those links uh, into the graph. Now this will get updated gradually over time, but in reality, um, apart from adding new subscribers, uh, add, at the, add at the edge, not much changes in major networks on a minute-by-minute on a -minute basis. Uh, other than routing, but you, you don't uh, necessarily add major pieces of equipment every five minutes. So the first step here is to use um, Spark SQL and just run a very simple select query to find all the links that are 90% loaded, uh, over 90% over loaded, I'm sorry. And we found one right there between E22 and uh, E31, 32, and 33, and it's, uh, it's link number six. So now we do a, a more interesting navigational query, and we go out in all directions, basically, but in, uh, in both directions, back to the left and to the right, looking at it from this perspective, to find the, the leaves of, of those uh, subgraphs. And the reason we want to do that is we want to find out where the traffic's originating. Now, in a, in a real telecom network, what happens is that individual pieces of equipment have thresholds set locally, and if things go wrong, they raise alarms. And the alarms are transmitted out to management uh, servers that will reroute, uh, you know, turn on more equipment or reroute things. However, those things, by and large, work very locally. Uh, so when the box is overloaded, it knows there's another box next door to it, so it will switch that one on. That may not be the best thing to do. It may be better to completely reroute things through another city or a, a completely different set of equipment. And that's actually what happens here, because once we've found that the, uh, the data's coming from a couple of places and ending up, sorry, it's coming from one place at the right-hand side there and ending up a, a couple of places on the left-hand side, then we can decide what we actually want to do about it. And the diagnosis is pretty straightforward. We, we found, you know, in this case, uh, we're pretending that someone's loading very high-definition, uh, ultra-high-definition TV video from coast to coast. And so at certain times, probably periodically, if it's a popular program, for instance, uh, the equipment's going to get overloaded. So we can go into predictive analytics as well. But for the moment, all we need to do is switch on this other link, and then some of the traffic will automatically reroute. Because the boxes individually will look for you know, the, the most uh, available route to send, send data out. So the solution here was actually uh, very, very straightforward. But the, the graph query in its own right is quite complex. In a real network here, we're probably talking from end to end, maybe 30 to 100 hops. Uh, and running that kind of query on a, a traditional database, a relational database, or actually most NoSQL technologies, is going to involve a lot of lookup operations and join operations. Uh, so if you have a graph structure underpinning all of this, 
or if you can load it all into memory, which uh, you know is quite often possible with with Spark, then the thing's going to run a great deal faster. So what we've looked at quickly, I'm prepared to talk about you know, lots of uh, lots of different examples here, but I think we wanted to give you a, a quick view of the kinds of pattern finding that are involved. Uh, but you can combine uh, open source fast and big data tools, um, which are really good at what they're designed for. And then if you extract the metadata from files or from the other uh, parts of data lake that you own, uh, and put it into a graph, then you open up new possibilities. And the key to it all is being able to do ultra-fast selective navigation and also uh, do pathfinding queries. And the pathfinding queries are particularly difficult in a very large graph. And as I said earlier, the, uh, the kind of island finding algorithm that uh, we, we looked at in that human intelligence problem uh, is, um, is is difficult to crack without the, the parallelism and the power of uh, something like Spark. And with that, I think there are a whole lot of questions here, and it's really where we want to spend our time. Um, so back to you, I think, Shannon, as moderator on this. Thank you, Leon. Uh, and of course, one of the most common questions that we get throughout the webinar are people asking about the slides and the recording. Just a reminder, I will send a, the uh, follow-up email out to all registrants by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides, the recording, and anything else requested throughout the webinar. Uh, uh, first question coming in for you, Leon, is uh, for, uh, for these data, for example, the network congestion data, that we are looking at um, needs to be loaded first and the data keeps changing all the time. So how does the loading of data that's changing every second happen using what tool? Um, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, a lot of the data is like that, it's a lot of streaming data. Um, so it wouldn't just be from telecom data, but financial transactions, for instance, when we looked at the, uh, the, the money laundering case, or if we were looking at uh, trying to detect fraud in trading, in trading stocks or derivatives, bonds, that kind of thing. Um, so you can use Spark streaming, Spark streams uh, for some of this, this data. Um, in the telco network, uh, that would probably be okay. Um, it would probably be fast enough to deal with the, the situation we saw here. Um, it wouldn't be fast enough to deal with things that need to change at the, you know, the couple of millisecond level. And those things can happen in telco networks, uh, particularly if alarm swarms occur, or if you have some large event in an area uh, and the local the local equipment gets congested. In that case, I recommend using something like Kafka. Uh, we have um, a proof of concept, for instance, that deals with a financial case, and it it's using um, Kafka to take the incoming financial transactions uh, and data about the transactions. And then it's um, using the queuing mechanisms in SAMHSA to divide up the work in order to load it into the graph in real time. So in near real time, obviously there are IOs uh, occurring. And um, because uh, in, in our particular situation, uh, we can either load things in uh, consistently with ACID transactions or we can, uh, we can pipeline things so that they uh, enter the graph um, aren't necessarily visible to everybody until everything's been connected up. So I, I'd say a combination of um, Spark, Spark Streams, Kafka, Kuhn, there are other uh, open source technologies out there as well which would deal with the fast moving stream um, are important. And in, in a real system, uh, besides just doing the analytics uh, in, in the background, so to speak, you'd probably put algorithms and thresholds and triggers into, um, into the, the front end of the stream, do some complex event processing, and then take information from those triggers to enhance the graph as well. Uh, 
one of the things right back near the beginning, I showed a, a picture where we saw the open source things and we saw Kafka streaming and we saw things span there. Um, well, rules get derived and the parameters change. Uh, and a smart system of doing predictive analytics will feed back new parameters into the uh, into the complex event processing stage so that it will uh, detect more things or throttle things down uh, if you're getting too many things that aren't of, of any great interest or don't turn out to be of interest. So combination of technologies and we've uh, you know we, we have applied Kafka and um, and Samza uh, with with some great success. I love it. Um, the next question coming in, would a model of having a relational data store, no SQL database for metadata work, the actual com, uh, data can be in graph databases, of course. Any comments on that? Um, yes, uh, it, uh, quite. Uh, graph databases have uh, had a resurgence in the, you know, in the last few years. And um, as in the open source community and our own, own product, um, object databases are inherently uh, Network, you know, that, that's what they were all about. Um, the reason that objectivity came about was because we were having, in, in our prior lives, we were having a lot of trouble dealing with highly interconnected data and data that had lots of variants. And uh, so the object database became a, a very powerful tool for working with that kind of data. Um, now, over over time, uh, obviously the the relational databases have a uh, a very, very significant part in the data world. Um, that we never, uh, uh, we never say that we compete in any way with the relational databases because that's not our aim. And I think the NoSQL players, the fact that there are so many of them now, are a testimony to the fact that not everything fits neatly into tables. And um, you know, document stores and key value stores and so on all have a, a part to play, but they play in different parts of the spectrum. Um, and the graph databases, by and large, so far, most of them don't scale that well. Or if they are distributed, they still rely uh, very heavily on memory to, um, to perform anything uh, anywhere near well. So you really need an engine that's been built from the ground up to deal with complex relationships, many-to-many uh, -many relationships, uh, and then you need the, uh, the kinds of queries that are hard to do with, uh, with SQL. So give you a, a simple example, if you have lots of uh, tables and lots of columns, and you try and find the connection between a row in one table and a row in another table, uh, and there are many tables involved, that gets a lot of joint operations and it gets very, very slow. Whereas with uh, a graph database, um, that's going to be very fast. But then there are different variants on how you tackle the problem. So you have the message-based distributed approach, you know, Craig or uh, basically GraphX is based on as well. And then you have the single logical view, single logical view distributed database, uh, which is what you know, we, we supply. So I think you, you do need to look carefully at uh, latency, at how quickly data is coming in, uh, whether it's mainly read-only from that point on or whether it gets changed a lot, uh, the length of the paths if you're pathfinding, uh, the numbers of different kinds of vertex and edge that might get involved in a path. And then you've got these uh, graph-wide problems, if you like, like finding islands, finding the span of the graph is important in some, some applications. Uh, where you really need to go very highly parallel and apply a lot of uh, computing, and there be a lot of invo I.O. involved as well in, in that kind of problem. And I love I all the questions. There's no one. Here, we've got, we've got quite a few coming up. So um, uh, can you describe the metadata you're speaking of and how that gets captured? Right, yes, well, the metadata can, <laughs> it can actually be any kind of data that you can extract from the data that's at your, uh, you know, uh, in your resource. Let's try and, take, let's take an example. Um, let's suppose that you have uh, video streams being captured off of K2 
cameras somewhere, let's say, in a big facility in an airport. Um, so the video streams themselves can go very neatly into specialized uh, storage structure or into straight into HDFS's files. You can chop them up you know, into, into five-minute segments or something. Um, and you, you obviously want to record you know, what those segments are so you can go back and put them together in the right order and so on. But then let's imagine that you also have uh, face recognition algorithms or a gait recognition, the way you're looking at how people walk, which is a characteristic of individuals. Um, so those algorithms will, will run looking at the data at the front end. Uh, some of them will take quite a bit of time to run, and then they'll extract information which will be like, like fingerprint information, that will be condensed into uh, some little structure, uh, which in itself might be a little graph structure. And it's that data which you then would store into the graph. Now, you'll have some fixed data. There's always, almost always some fairly static data, uh, like the locations in the airport, you know, the gateways in the airport, the, uh, the tunnels under the airport. All those things are pretty static. And you'll want to relate the things and the people to where they are, uh, where they pop up. You know, they're, right now they're in the store, and now they're in the airline club, and now they're heading down towards the gate. Uh, oops, I just went through a door somewhere that goes out onto the concourse. That's not good. So that's the kind of mess data. It will depend entirely on the problem. And I think if you, the more you talk to data scientists, the more you find that one of the first things they discovered wasn't in the data that they were already collecting. They discovered they needed to find other kinds of data as well. Or that the data was being collected, but it was being thrown away quickly because they didn't have a means to store it or the means to analyze it at the volume that it occurs. Uh, we have systems that are really huge running, and um, we, I don't know how many new nodes and edges are added per day, but we're told that the analysts who use those systems regularly process tens of trillions of nodes and edges per day uh, in going back their normal business. Now, some of that is done in machine learning, and some of it is done in you know, pretty much ad hoc queries or in modified queries that are canned queries where they, they add things to the queries in order to discover new stuff. And of course, the picture's changing all the time. So one of the great things about a graph, particularly if you have a, a flexible schema, as we have, is that you can add new node types, new connection types as you find the need for them. Or you can go back and consolidate things. So you might find out that you're not really interested in whether they got there by uh, rail or road or, or water, you can just say they got there and create a new kind of relationship. It's just that uh, there's a trip between place A and place B and the, and the person or persons uh, who made those trips. So the whole thing is, is changing. Um, and in some situations, uh, in the intelligence field, for instance, then new kinds of information can get discovered every day, and that needs to be propagated out to all the people who need to be cognizant of it. Um, you, you don't yeah. have to write bespoke programs, so I was just thinking, uh, you know, blending. Blending has become a big topic. Um, uh, tools uh, such as Talent, which you know, can extract data from other places, uh, waterline data, uh, Platfora, there, there are lots of different tools now. Some of them um, require programmer effort. Some of them are becoming much more automated, so you can just uh, present users, data scientists, or even end users uh, with a, a palette of different kinds of data and sources, and they can plug them together and get analytics out quite quickly. Um, if you've never tried it, I, I suggest the smaller scale looking at something like Orange, uh, which um, you know in 10 minutes you can figure out what it does. You can hook it up to simple data sources, uh, standard kind of data sources and the CS3 files and spreadsheets and so on, and, and get a good feel for that kind of platform. Um, that's why you know, we, we are an engine builder. Um, we, we don't build visualization tools. Uh, you know, we, we provide things that they look at our data, look at our graph, of course, but that's not what we intend to do. So we, we don't do the uh, machine learning, we don't do the blending, we don't do the visualization. But we have partners that do all of those things. 
Sure, that makes sense. Uh, now, Leon, I don't know if you have something handy, but maybe we can get something uh, to send out in the follow-up email. Do you have a slide of a sample technology ecosystem? I'm sorry, a sample technology ecosystem? Correct. Is that, that what you said? I think, uh, yeah, I think we have several. There may even be um, an appropriate one up on our, uh, on our blog. So yes, I'll make sure that we, we do that when we send out the answers. Perfect, I love it. Um, and I'll get that out to everyone in the follow-up email with links to the slides and the recording. Um, and is pattern finding done at name level, data type, metadata, uh, item type, or even further? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, yes, because, you know, we get into schemas and talk about metadata, and then there's metadata about metadata. Uh, yes, yeah, so in a good, a good pattern finding system, you should be able to use uh, properties of the individual objects and connections, or go by the types. And if you have the inheritance in it, of course, that becomes even more powerful. So uh, you might do a, a first query, for instance, to find out whether there's any connection between person A and person X, just any kind of connection. And so that can work uh, at the high level, depending on the implementation of the database, if, it's, if you've got a good, strong graph uh, database underneath there, then it's going to be able to uh, run across any kind of connection regardless of its type and find whether or not there is something. And if the, um, if the platform is good, it may be able to actually answer the first part of that question without having traversed the graph at all. So we actually have technology which will weed out some things which are not going to result in a path very, very quickly. Uh, so the, the ability to uh, include particular nodes and exclude others, I think, is very important by type. And then the, uh, the other things that become mainly properties, or it may be that uh, you don't want to go past a node if that node is connected to another node of a specific type. So let's suppose we have nodes that represent kinds of weather, and I'm traversing the graph going from the west coast to the east coast, and I get to St. Louis, and I find that St. Louis right now is connected to a thunderstorm uh, node, then I don't want to go any further. I don't want to go to St. Louis, and I, I need to explore other paths instead. So, um, yeah, it, it, it is important, and a, and a good uh, graph query will involve types and inclusion and exclusion, as well as the, the actual individual properties. You can also, of course, um, as I said, you, graphs are everything. You, you can go in there and uh, find things with straightforward SQL to get started and look for outliers um, or, or apply machine learning library to use other categories, you know, some other kind of index, for instance, or a collection. So a collection that's being built, uh, the collection being like a subgraph. So you build a subgraph, um, and then that gets enhanced as things get updated. And, uh, one that comes to mind was um, a system we built with a legal database company some time ago that uh, answered questions for lawyers about particular kinds of case and the case law that went with it. And then if anything changed in another another judgment, uh, then all those lawyers were, were sent updates. You know, um, their their, their uh, pages were, were hit in those days um, to tell them that something had changed in the, in the, uh, in the overall graph. I just love all these questions coming in. Um, thank you so much. Is it, uh, next question is, is it possible to define a schema template for a particular data set in a graph database and enforce compliance with that schema? Um, it, it, it depends entirely on what you decide, how you decide to store the data. If you're putting it into um, some kind of unstructured data store, uh, you, you'd have to recognize the type and apply the rules yourself. Um, if you're putting it into any kind of uh, database that has a schema, then it will enforce rules on, on types. Uh, and particularly on the connections, in our case, for instance, all, all of our products will enforce cardinality rules, and uh, the connections have to be known of a, 
and then type unless you're using just a generic link. Um, so I, I'd say a, a good graph database will, will definitely raise flags if you try and put the wrong kind of connection between things. Uh, if you try and store something you don't have a schema definition for it, you're going to get an error as well. Uh, but the good news is that you can then handle that as an exception and decide whether to um, add a new inherited class or create an entirely new class. Sometimes those things uh, require human intervention, otherwise they can, they can get out of hand. You know, if you think of um, a set of data that's got 20 components, uh, you know, how many different object classes can you make out of those 20 components? Uh, if you let the machine do it automatically, you may end up with a graph that uh, doesn't tell you as much as you want. And right along those lines, Leon, for data with multiple hierarchical levels, would a graph data store be a good fit for a document store like, um, well, just would a graph store, data store be a good fit for a document store? Um, yes, in, in general, uh, doc, document databases have their place. Um, they, they're geared to store chunks of text or, or structured text um, these days, uh, and they have generally relatively few connections between the documents. Uh, you know, it varies a bit, obviously, with scientific documents where you might have 100 references. But in, in most cases, uh, you've got a, a bunch of data that lives together for most of its life and it has some connections to other things. And the document database is, is perfectly adequate for most of those kind of problems. Um, with, a, with an object of graph database, uh, you can break the thing down into smaller components, um, and uh, you could even break it down to the word level, uh, little, little use of the word, so you've got connections from the word to all the sentences that use that word. Um, what you've got to watch out for is the balance of uh, the kinds of queries you're going to do, particularly graph queries, and the amount of IOs you're going to do. Now, let's imagine that every node, the, the main data type that I have is large. Let's, let's say it's a, a 40 gigabyte video, for instance. Um, if I, I can store the, the 40 gigabyte thing, and I can store another one next to it. Now, if I come and store the connection, the connections are going to have to go somewhere else. And so it makes sense to leave the data where it is uh, and then just take the metadata, so the name of the video, and then uh, any other things you're interested in, you know, who, are, who are the characters, who's the cast, who's the director, uh, all the kind of metadata you find in something like um, IMDB, for instance, a very good, very good application of graph uh, online. And uh, then you can, go in, you can ask very interesting questions of it without having to go and do all the IOs involved in pulling up the individual objects, the movie objects, because uh, clearly that's not necessary until you've, you've um, refined the search. And this next question is very specific to the uh, objectivity database. So how much integration work is necessary for objectivity APIs to use Spark, um, RDDs, data frames, and data sets? Um, very little out of the box with um, well with, with objectivity DB itself you uh, you would uh, you would you would want to write a Java program to do that until recently with ThingSpan we've done that work for you so there's a component in ThingSpan uh, called ThingSpan for Spark and what it does is go into um, it, it works two ways it can go into the uh, database the underlying ThingSpan metadata store. Uh, extract a schema and produce RDDs. You can guide it because you may not be interested in all the object classes in there. Maybe you've got 400 object classes and you only want uh, three or four of them available up to machine learning library, for instance. So you define what you want in the RDD and then we generate, we automatically generate uh, the RDD. And then if the underlying parts of the graph change, then we automatically regenerate those things for you so that uh, when you apply of the Spark components to the RDDs, uh, sorry, to the data frames, we present them as data frames with the schema. So as, as you apply components to, uh, to the data frames, um, they will tend to use, as Spark will make sure that you have worker nodes that are close to the data frames in memory that are needed by that worker node. 
And then if anything changes underneath in uh, at this level because of updates coming in, say from streaming data, uh, then the uh, the data plane itself will get refreshed, and replicas of the data plane will get refreshed as well. So it's just, it's pretty much seamless. Now going the other way, uh, if you drop uh, ThinSpan into uh, a Spark environment, and then you use um, the regular data specs to define data frames, and then direct them so that they go into uh, ThinSpan, then you can start collecting that data straight away and, and building the graph. So you don't have to use our tools uh, to create the schema. But the problem at the moment is that data frames are tabular. And that's where graph frames are much more interested. Um, they're, it, the, the spec of graph frames is just about um, firmed up. I think we're going to start seeing real things that we can work with in uh, June or July. And because they have a, a much na more natural fit to the underlying graph structures, I think that's going to make life a lot easier. But right now, yes, you can, you can define it, and we will figure out that there are connections in graph connections in the underlying database and make sure that we exploit them when you use the data frame. Because we provide adapters as well as the data structure. Uh, you may think we're doing a join up at, uh, in Spark SQL, for instance, but in reality, we'll be using the relationship then there between uh, the customer and their account, uh, you know, and a, and a particular transaction. Well, so as we just mentioned this, sure, yeah, and, and as you just mentioned this, I'll, I'll skip to this next question. Um, do, you have, do you have customers that work with large OWL files? Large what files, sorry? OWL, O-W-L. Oh, owl. I'm sorry. Yes, I had. <laughs> um, uh, yes, we, we've had customers work with large owl files, um, mainly over. Uh, if I remember correctly, they were over in the advertising world, the ad tech world. Um, owl is very interesting. Uh, it, it started out with a lot of strength behind it. Then we found that um, our particular customer base over in the intelligence community. Uh, found a lot of shortcomings with OWL, and they, they were generally using horn logic, for instance. Um, so it didn't catch on quite the, the way it might have done, as far as we were concerned. Uh, we do have an example, I think, up on the website. Uh, we go into the developer network support side. Um, you'll find some examples of our RDF. Um, we don't supply OWL tools uh, or, or, or any of that infrastructure, but there's no reason why you can't store OWL and store RDF um, very cleanly into, into things down or into the graph database. It'll go into the next data store with no problems. And I'll say that there are examples of doing that. But we don't provide tools that directly access them. They would have to, to work in our environment. They would have to work uh, either through ODBC or preferably with things down, work through data frames and then ultimately graph frames, hopefully by the end of the year uh, through graph frames. Sure, and I think this next question, you know, is, is, is one that's necessary when we're talking about metadata. Um, how do you exploit the data quality results in the pattern finding in metadata and its data lineage? <laughs> that, that's a great question because um, I, I wish I had a very simple answer to that one. Uh, data quality is a huge thing, governance, you know, provenance, um, however you, you term it, uh, in risk management, um, getting the quality of uh, of information, it's really outside the scope of the database. Um, you have to use algorithms. You can use machine learning library algorithms. People have their own proprietary algorithms. Because of course, you can mix and match uh, your own algorithms or anyone's algorithms with uh, things like MLlib and GraphX and SQL uh, and our own API. Um, now, having discovered something, gone to all the trouble of finding something and deciding that particular kinds of data or sets of data are of high enough quality to warrant further attention, that's where I think you want to enhance the graph and you want to keep that uh, little subgraph or the, the answer set or the conditions uh, in the graph so that they can be used by other people. And uh, I think this is becoming increasingly important in a lot of domains now, uh, and where particularly you have um, self-help uh, you know, data scientists setting things up 
make things available to users, and then users going in and trying to find stuff for themselves. Because uh, if left their own devices and without guidance, you know, they are likely to find a lot of uh, a lot of false um, information. I've seen some very there's a lovely site up on the internet somewhere that correlates anything with anything. You can you can tell it to find things that correlate with the price of cheese, and it will come up with all sorts of very interesting looking things that correlate statistically, but have no meaning whatsoever in all probability. If um, if we'd like to um, address that in a little bit more detail, by the way, then please just um, you know, ping us at infoobjectivity.com. And our people will read everything to me or the right person here, and we'll get back with a, you know, sp some specifics and tell you what people have actually done uh, using our product. Yeah, sure. Um, or, or, and the, or that we've seen, sorry, you know, we've seen in academia or whatever. So, but very happy to help out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if, and if um, uh, Anna or Alyssa wouldn't mind following up, sending me that um, link, I'll make sure that gets in the follow-up email as well. There's um, certainly some requests for that. Um, uh, can you uh, run, uh, well, actually, let me stay on the data quality um, uh, one more, a little bit. What is it about data quality trending results um, to it? I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but. Um... Well, this is, yeah, this is a, it's a matter of um, selective and adaptive filtering, I think, uh, more than anything. So um, you, you may, uh, I think one good example of this occurs in, uh, in data and telco networks. Um, you know, you have a particular device that goes down and it's got uh, 10,000 people connected to it, and that causes a swarm of alarms. Um, so that can ripple out. You get this, you get a real um, ripple effect through the network if you don't clamp it down quickly. Uh, and so it's very important to, to detect thresholds. And if it happens, and uh, it happens frequently, then you want to go back and look at it over a longer period of time, try and figure out what triggers these things and how to prevent that, that occurring in the future. And we saw a good example of that a few years ago back on you know, the East Coast when the, the electricity grid went down. Um, it, it would have been preventable if there had been some coordinating body that was able to catch what was going on at a system-wide level, but of course there wasn't. Uh, individual utilities were dealing with their own point problems. Um, once, once, you've, once you've obtained a good filter, though, you know, then it can get applied at the complex event processing end. Or you can go back by deep data mining um, using machine learning and either decide to exclude some kinds of data or just aggregate them. Um, there's one field of interest here that's worth looking into that's still uh, evolving. And that's the field of granular computing, which is a is really a, um, a a mathematics discipline that I think is very very interesting because uh, it, it's certainly I think going to be beneficial in in uh, handling some of the data quality problems that we see. All right, we just have two minutes left. Uh, I think I will. So let's. I'll throw out one more question to you, Leon. I'll get the rest of the questions to you that we didn't have a time to get to today. Um, for for any follow up that you want to do, um, can you uh, just going back to the uh, owl? Can you run inferencing programs that operate against an owl file to determine uh, erroneous data and project missing data? Ah. That's, that's an interesting one. Well, if you know something about the connectedness, it is possible. Um, you know, from, from my own experience, whenever we have taken data from uh, some of the traditional databases um, or from NoSQL sources, then you find a lot of uh, ambiguity. Um, so you'll, you'll find uh, things that are connected that shouldn't be. This is particularly the case where humans are involved, by the way. So people people have to fill in a form online, and they don't know the answer. It could be a contract code, for instance. You know, you're a you're a manufacturing company or a sales company. They'll make one up, and so you get all these uh, false bits of data in in the system. So I think um, you know it, it's uh, it is it is uh, I think this one deserves a longer answer. So if you don't mind. I'll, I'll pump that one and we'll answer it in the, uh, the follow-up. 
Sure, I love it. Um, Leon, thank you so much for this great presentation and for uh, the uh, Q&A. And thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just really appreciate all the great questions coming in. Again, I'll get anything unanswered over to Leon. Um, and thanks to Objectivity for sponsoring today's webinar. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, the recording, and all the additional fabulous information we requested throughout the webinar. I hope everyone has a great day. Again, Leon, thank you so much. Thank you, Shannon. Bye, everyone.